So in your your book, Unwinding Anxiety, you put forward a solution to anxiety and, and these destructive habits that can be downstream of anxiety uh, is to rewire the survival or old brain, um, not the, the kind of rational or, or new brain. Can you explain the difference between the old and the new brain if someone's hearing that for the first time? Yeah. And this is, I, I want to highlight that this is a, a heuristic. It's a, it's a useful explanatory model. It's not really how the brain is set up. So often we'll hear about the lizard brain or this or that. The brain's not really set up with layers like this. Certainly there's a cortical layer on top of these, you know, more basic structures like the basal ganglia, yet they're very intricately <laughs> connected with each other. But the heuristic is really helpful. And the way that works is, you know, these, these, these very important survival mechanisms are going to win out over over other mechanisms that aren't as critical and, and we can even think of them as the ones that evolved later in you know in time like planning i or you know this heuristic is that they they're kind of a newer and the younger part of the brain so for example the prefrontal cortex is a younger part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective and it's involved in planning and in cognitive control, you know, willpower, things like that. And so ironically, it's the first part of the brain that goes offline when we get stressed or anxious. You know, there's this term, uh, I've probably heard it, hangry, you know, when we're, we're hungry, we get angry, we have trouble with self-control. Or in addiction treatment, we learn this uh, acronym HALT. When we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, that's when we're vulnerable to relapse because that's when our, you know, our thinking, our willpower, our cognitive control parts of the brains are least functional. And so from a very pragmatic perspective, you know, I don't know if this started with the age of enlightenment or whatnot, you know, I think therefore I am, we've been really focusing on thinking our ways out of problems. Yet where this is, you know, this was the dominant paradigm before neuroscience was even a field of study. And if you take a neuroscience approach, the neuroscience would say, you know, willpower at best is, you know, it's more myth than muscle. And so we said, well, you know, if, if you can't rely on this part of the brain, let's look at these older parts of the brain that are really strong, you know, and they're going to dominate when, you know, when we're, you know, when our prefrontal cortex goes offline, let's leverage the power of that part of the brain. And that's where, that's the habit part of the brain. It's kind of, you know, we, f we default to our habits when we're on autopilot, but also when that thinking part of the brain goes offline. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, it, it gets me thinking about uh, something that Dan Buettner, I'm not sure if you know him, You've, you've probably come across his work with the blue zones, but I've heard, something I've that heard, he often, Oh, yes. That's what I was going to say, blue zones. Yeah. It's something that he often says is the difference between uh, centenarians in the blue zones and people in, in developed countries who are experiencing poor health and have a, a, a shorter health span and are living shorter lives is, is not willpower. <laughs> it's not that the centenarians, you know, have you know, this greater degree of willpower. It's that, you know, he puts it down to the, the fact that they just live in, in an environment that is conducive to, to better habits. Um, but there's some overlap there, I guess, with regards to you know, willpower or willing our way to better habits, perhaps not being the, the best strategy. Maybe we can come back to an environment if, if and, and when we get the opportunity to talk about food, because I, I know you have some things to, to say on that. Uh, so this idea of, of <clears throat> focusing on the kind of quote unquote old brain or where we default to when we're under stress, is this what you mean when you say in order to develop new habits, we have to change the way we think about our habits? Yes. And I would say absolutely. And from a pragmatic standpoint, we have to change the way we feel about habits. And what I mean by that is the feeling body 
is much stronger than the thinking brain. And to just double click on that, when you look at habit formation, it's driven by how something feels, right? Is something rewarding or not? It's not about, well, I think this is good or bad for me, right? If, if we could just use our thinking brain, then none of my patients would smoke because they all know that smoking is bad for them. But their feeling body says, well, I'm going into withdrawal. This doesn't feel good. Okay, so I know I shouldn't smoke, but I'm going to because it scratches that itch of withdrawal. So that feeling body is so powerful. And so, you know, we really focus on that as like, okay, let's change the way we feel about habits. And what I mean by that is we bring awareness in so that we can really feel into what the results of these behaviors are. So as we mentioned earlier, this process is called reward-based learning for a reason. If something's rewarding, we're going to keep doing it. If it's not rewarding, we're going to stop. So from a neuroscience standpoint, there's this critical element that drives what's called an error term that changes behavior. And that critical element is awareness. If you pay attention and something is rewarding, you're going to keep doing it. If you pay attention and it's not rewarding, you're going to stop. And then as you pay attention, you see how rewarding something is, it becomes a habit. Uh, Let's use an everyday example. Let's say a new bakery opens up in my neighborhood and I go in there, I like chocolate cake. So I have a certain expectation for what good chocolate cake tastes like. And so if I go in there and I eat their chocolate cake, it's like the most delicious chocolate cake I've ever had. (laughs) I get what's called a positive prediction error, which means it's better than expected. Dopamine fires in my brain. I learn good bakery, go back there. On the other hand, if I eat the cake, I'm like, meh, I've had better. My brain gets a negative prediction error and it says, don't bother. Also dopamine firing, I learn, don't go back to that bakery. So I've learned in both scenarios. We're trying to to break these associations that we have, these kind of uh, reflexive, behaviors that we have to a particular trigger with attention, drawing attention to them and reassigning the the value or the reward that we get from them. Yeah. And the good news is we don't have to actively reassign anything. Our brain will do it for us as long as we pay attention, as long as we're aware of what's happening. So for example, if we're really aware of what a cigarette tastes and smells like you know i I, that's what i have my patients do i say go smoke and they look at me like my doc just told me to smoke but i say pay attention when you smoke and they go out and smoke and they realize the cigarettes taste like crap and so there that gets reassigned in their brain because they're now paying attention they never tasted good they just kind of ignore that because they're more focused on getting that dopamine hit and getting you know relieving that withdrawal but they can't, once they pay attention, they can't ignore that. And they can do the same thing with worrying. You know, say, well, pay attention to the results of worrying. And what, what do you get? Well, I feel more anxious. Oh, I didn't notice that before. Oh. And they start to become disenchanted with the worrying because they realize it's not solving their problems. It's not keeping them safe. And in fact, it's feeding back and making them more anxious. Hey, friends. The scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12-week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof 
of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. So is there a tipping point that that needs to be reached in order to to break that habit? I'm just thinking here about the example of, let's say, the, the, the person who's smoking that they would have to be so disgusted by the the smell and the the taste that it was outweighing that immediate relief that they are getting that they can feel. Yeah, absolutely. You you've hit the nail on the head, which is if so, if the reward value is net positive, they're going to keep doing it. If it's net negative, they start to become disenchanted. If it's really negative, it, that disenchantment builds even faster. Uh, and, and as a, an example, my lab did a study with our, we have this app called Eat Right Now that helps people pay attention as they eat. It helps people with emotional eating, overeating, et cetera. And we looked to see how quickly that reward value dropped below zero. Ready for this? It only takes 10 to 15 times on average for somebody to really pay attention to whatever eating feels like for that reward value to be net negative and for them to change their behavior. Now, we all know this from our own experience. <laughs> Nobody ever says, oh, it feels so good when I overeat. You know, they're like, oh, bloated. Oh, my stomach's exploding. Oh, I feel lethargic. All this negative stuff that we kind of ignore or <laughs> watch television so that we are, <laughs> we're distracted from it. But when people really pay attention, they can gather that information pretty quickly. So when someone's eating that cake they're try- and they're trying to break that habit, it's a little different to the cigarette. It, the taste is amazing, but what you're saying is in terms of paying attention, in this instance, they're paying attention to the more immediate things that they, they can feel, how their digestion is, whether they have energy afterwards, as opposed to thinking about the long-term consequences of eating those foods. Um, because I know we're, we're, we're pretty poor, I guess, at uh, delayed gratification, practicing delayed gratification versus you know, immediate gratification and um, acting on, on impulse because that slice of cake tastes amazing. Yes. Yeah. And that's an evolutionary function that says, I don't know if I'm going to be alive in 10 years. So rather eat the cake now or smoke the cigarette now as compared to, well, maybe I'll gain weight or maybe I'll get cancer. So yes, very ser- serious delay discounting curve, meaning that you know we're going to favor those immediate rewards over future ones. And it's hard for us to imagine into the future, but it's pretty easy for us to imagine what that first taste of cake is going to feel like. So let, let's use a real world example. We run a live group every week for people using our digital therapeutics. And somebody came to the group and said, you know, I was going to a party with my husband and my friend makes this, you know, world renowned cake. You know, she's like, everybody talks about this cake, you know, cause it's so good. She's like, I was going to this party fully expecting to eat three pieces of this cake. Cause that's what I've always done. So she was using our Eat Right Now program and learning to pay attention as she ate. And so she ate, literally, she she was so incredulous. She's like, I ate half a piece of this cake and it was still delicious, but then I didn't want any more. And I turned to my husband and said, does the cake not taste as good? And he's like, no, it tastes just as good as it always does. But she's realizing she didn't need to eat more to really enjoy it. And in fact, when she ate more, She enjoyed it less because her body was saying, dude, that's too much. I think of it as this this pleasure plateau, you know, and so it's like, how much is enough? You eat, you know, it tastes good, tastes good, tastes good. And then it stops, you know, our body's like, okay, whoa, put on the brakes. And then we hit this plateau where it's no longer rewarding. And then if we don't pay attention, we're going to go over this cliff of overindulgence, (laughs) you know, and we're off the cliff and then we crash and, and think, boy, that was, that was three pieces. My, I feel terrible now. For someone to kind of navigate this in their own life, and you mentioned habit loops before, but what we're talking about here is identifying what's 
triggering you to take certain action, whatever the behavior is that uh, perhaps you're trying to get rid of or reduce. And then using attention to really hone in on how you actually feel after that behavior. So getting very, very, I guess, purposeful, honest with what that experience is and in doing so, reassigning the value that is attached to that action. Yeah, and I would say, so when it's habitual, we're not paying attention to how rewarding it is. We're just acting it out on autopilot. So I would, I would say the reassignment, I would say we can think of it as re-assigning, meaning we're seeing clearly how rewarding it actually is right now. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And so I just want to be clear about that because often people try to think themselves into changing behavior like, this should be bad for me, or I shouldn't like cake, or I shouldn't eat cake. Well, cake tastes good. Ice cream tastes good. Chocolate tastes good. You know, that's always for people that like chocolate, ice cream, cake, it's always going to taste good. And if they pay attention, they're going to realize how delicious it actually is. So the reassignment comes when we see what the results are, for example, when we eat too much or when we smoke a cigarette and realize that, oh, I never really paid attention. You know, I started smoking when I was a teenager. And I never really paid attention to how bad it actually tastes and smells. Well, now they can't not see that because that that's right in their face when they're paying attention. That's the critical aspect. I think of it as developing disenchantment with the behavior. And that disenchantment comes exclusively from awareness. If they're not paying attention, they're just going to keep doing it. 